This is a special episode of the Immunology Podcast, IUIS 2023, Day 4. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rad. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. Today we're back with our fourth special episode from IUIS 2023. As always, we'll be discussing our favorite sessions throughout the past 24 hours of the meeting. So if you weren't able to attend, we've got you covered. We're going to kick things off in just a minute, but before we get to that... Are you tired of tedious and time-consuming cell isolation processes? Say goodbye to manual labor and hello to Efficiency with RoboSEP, your ultimate solution for automated cell isolation. Visit www.stemcell.com forward slash RoboSEP to learn more about how you can reduce hands-on time, increase sample throughput, and achieve true walk-away automation on your cell isolations. Boo manual labor, Brenda. Boo. Boo manual labor. Yes, robot overloads. Just take over. I love my robot instruments. I have. <laughs> they make life better. Yeah. Until they don't, and they ha- you, you have no idea what to do with Just it. Just don't so. give them guns. All right. We won't. Okay. Just give them some magnetic columns or, or, or isolation products. Exactly. All right. Fourth day, amazing science. Four or five. All right. You you do the morning keynotes. What'd you see? Yes. Well, morning keynote, first keynote was by Linda Gale Baker from the Desmond Tutu Foundation and HIV Center. Um, she was presenting in a very kind of opportune day because today is uh, International AIDS Day. And it's been 40 years since the discovery of HIV as the cause of AIDS. Um, so uh, Linda gave a wonderful, wonderful overview of what has it, what the last 40 years have been in terms of how she went through everything, the start, uh, the basic science, how when she, she walked us through how we, we uh, the first uh, signs of the virus appeared, how when we discover, uh, she has some nice recordings of, you know, historical recordings, it was really nice. Uh, so basically she walked us through 40 years of HIV uh, and about the advances both in treatment, in uh, diagnostics, uh, how much of a struggle it was uh, for for a long time, uh, the how the epidemic evolved in you know in the U.S. but also in South Africa. South Africa was you know was very hardly hit. And um, what I want to say is that so what she that kind of the, the basic idea that she left us with is that a lot has been done. Uh, we have gone through that. I think the darkest days of AIDS are behind us, uh, but there is still a lot to do. And she uh, highlighted how still uh, adolescents, young mothers, children are still at a dis- disproportionate risk for AIDS uh, and how important it is to have activism and equitable access to treatment. Uh, and she showed a lot of a lot of initiatives targeting adolescents and young people that are now being kind of in the eye of the storm, in a way, um, she also made it not clear that uh, AIDS um, initiatives and, and, and AIDS uh, action is a political statement. How important it is to have global uh, coordination in these topics, and she uh, left us with kind of five actions that they th- she thinks are crucial for making AIDS history. Uh, we need to stop vertical transmission from mothers to children. She mentioned that nowadays many of the mothers that uh, give AIDS to their children, they don't know they have it until the day they, they give birth. Uh, so early, uh, it's very important for them to know their status because if, if you know, then you can prevent vertical transmission. Uh, equity, leave no one behind, leave no country behind, leave no group age behind, continue to innovate. She mentions a lot of preventive, uh, novel preventive mechani- uh, uh, initiatives and tools that uh, can be used, that can have a long lasting protection. It's not only about taking a pill a day, there's many other um, uh, ways of providing long lasting protection. If it's not vaccination, vaccination is kind of the next thing she suggests. Vaccines, vaccines are not there yet, but there are other things we can do to prevent transmission. And of course, putting keeping AIDS in the global agenda just because it's a lot better in developed countries doesn't mean that we are out of the woods. Yeah, so why don't I ask you about, I know that you went to the gut, in gut we trust. Oh. I had to go, if not for the topic, then for the pun. Did you trust your guts? I always there? trust my gut. All right. <laughs> so 
we had a really cool uh, talk by Dan Lipman from NYU. He was looking at antigen presenting cells for the gut microbiota um, and T cell differentiation programs. Long story short, to kind of get to the really cool science, we know the microbiome is required for uh, immunotherapy because in germ-free mice it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of data now from FMTs and other trials that it can modulate uh, the success of immunotherapy. More to come on exactly what happens, but that's known now. That's like foundationally true. So they saw that B. vulgatus supports anti-PD-1 efficacy, and it's a T-cell-dependent effect. And so they did some work on that in an orthotopic lung cancer model they were doing, and antibiotics abrogates it and all this stuff. Oh, and abrogates anti-tumor efficacy, not just a B. vulgatus, but just regular mice given antibiotics have worse anti-PD-1 benefits. doesn't work as well. So they did a symbiosis experiment, which is really cool. Right, so you have symbiosis, you stitch two mice together, and then you have two mice and one, and then they share blood systems, but it could be genetically different. So you can do some cool stuff. But you can't do that for microbiome experiment because mice are corpophagic, and so each other's poop and have the same microbiome. So they did separated cage symbiosis. So they give one mouse B. vulgatus, and the other mouse in the other cage, which had the other CD41, so CD41.1 versus CD45.2, right? So they did the, the, the isotypes. They... Uh, the other mouse had the cancer. And then they did some surgery with duct work, some piping and tubing to connect their vasculature permanently. Oh my God. And demonstrated that the bacteria from the mouse in, given in cage one helped with the cancer in the mouse in cage two. Now, they don't know if it's metabolites or cell mediated. There's a lot of theories right now that I've seen elsewhere that the immune cell is trained, and we've covered this on the podcast by the microbiota to recognize things better. And so that would make it cell-based, mm -hmm. but we don't know yet, but that was really cool. And I just love that experiment because Poor it's, my <laughs> because it's symbiosis in the extreme. Um, there was another bit of work by Maria Resingo on gut liver brain axis. She really found a gut vascular or a, 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 a vascular barrier marker called PV1. It's regulated both in, I think it's, I want to say it's down regulated, but I actually forget because it's been a day. Uh, it's um, regulated and disrupt, altered with changes in the gut vasculature. And so that's one little thing. And it drives metastasis. If you break the gut vasculature down, you have more metastasis. DSS helps damage it, but they also see that it affects the brain barrier. And the choroid plexus gets more permeable as well and has the same genetic response. And then that also alters behavior. It's part of why they think that mice are more, or in people potentially are more depressed with gut inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a brain gut axis barrier. They see it in the liver as well. Um, and so the inflammation in one spot seems to be driving leaky vasculature elsewhere. And that has its own sequela. And then Kathy McCoy got to talk some, and she was looking at the microbiome metabolites shaping mucosal immune responses. As a plug, they did a whole microbiome uh, metabolite atlas of all the tissues, including like small bowel, large bowel, urine, serum, pick something. And they have an R Shiny app for the data that you can go look at everything. Oh, nice. That's fun. Um, she also talked about FMT. But the interesting thing is that while the gut microbiome alters CAR T cell therapy as well as um, immune checkpoint therapy, it works still in germ-free mice. But we already know that in patients, if you're on antibiotics within the four months preceding or during CAR T cell therapy, you have worse outcomes. Wow. But they don't Gosh. know why. Um, and they saw that there was some decreased exhaustion they could get as in a system working with a specific called bacteria called B. pseudolongum. And they are starting it linked to it, the metabolite inosine. They haven't fully gotten there yet. We know inosine's a metabolite of that. We know, and then they, she showed inosine alone rescued it, but she didn't show inosine with the bacteria is what was doing it. But it's a likely culprit. And that was some new hot off the press unpublished data. So there we go. My gut has been trusted and I was a happy boy. <laughs> nice. That sounds very, very exciting. Well, I would be... If it, I would be jealous of such good research if it was because I was at an exceptional session. We had only rock stars in my session. Uh, we started out, so this was kind of a, the vaguely titled Understanding Immunity to Cancer. Uh, but it was started off with Miriam Merat from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, 
talking about a really cool story. She she's really focusing on macrophages uh, in various contexts. Of course, macrophages are very important to for for cancer immunity. And I I don't want to make it too long. So basically, what they did is that they did this, uh, you know, very very um, detailed analysis of. Uh, macrophages uh, in a mouse uh, model of, of, of cancer. I forgot which particular tumor it was. And they show that these macrophages, so myeloid cells in general, respond to uh, IL-4 uh, produced by the tumor. And this that this remodels the, the myeloid compartment in the tumor. Um, uh, also uh, IL-4, so if they have IL-4 uh, knockout, these actually... Uh, increases tumor uh, survival. Sorry, it was uh, reduces tumor tumor survival. And so they had a, a model uh, of, of ovarian cancer, and they also show that the ovarian cancer show, the cells are producing IL-4, and again, the removal of IL-4 receptor uh, from the myel from the myeloid cells improves anti-tumor immunity. And they kind of took this uh, uh, an extra level, and they actually had human data on combined PD-1 and IL-4 receptor blockade uh, in non-small cell lung cancer. And actually, the results were really, really interesting and in how this combination therapy seems to actually really, the, the addition of the uh, IL-4 receptor blockade uh, synergizes with the PD-1 uh, uh, blocking as well. And then second up, second up was Lara McKay uh, from the Doherty Institute in Australia. She is uh, the queen of resident memory cells, and she uh, delighted us with a cool uh, story while well, talking about, of course, tissue resident memory cells, and particularly, I think, a story about um, looking at T cells in the tumor from a tissue resident memory uh, lens and how it is hard to differentiate uh, using kind of standard uh, signatures from tissue resident cells from skin. It's kind of hard to differentiate uh, tissue resident memory cells from uh, tumors, but they actually, by doing a lot of single cell sequencing and kind of clustering, they actually can identify different clusters of cells and they can come up with a new signature of tissue resident memory cells from the tumor. They are all CD103 uh, CD positive, and they are distinct from what would what we classically consider uh, exhausted T cells in the tumor. Um, and they have different transcriptomes that kind of really cluster them apart. And that this signatures actually, uh, the cells with a signature actually have a better capacity to repopulate tumors, they have more plasticity. So they have they really do seem to have a separate phenotype compared to classically exhausted cells. Uh, and they kind of define what the signature is for tumor tissue resident memory cells. Uh, they are distinct from others. Uh, and uh, after it was John Wary from the University of Pennsylvania. Whoa. Also, whoa. Uh, huge. No, was, I'm telling you, was the lineup was ex ex excellent, exceptional. And... Uh, John Wary, you know, also one of the leading experts on T-cell exhaustion. Again, masterclass on uh, on T-cell exhaustion, and particularly with a particular emphasis on the on the on the, on the role of tox. Uh, that um, is, uh, is, is, is is highly associated with uh, the exhausted uh, or pre-exhausted uh, T-cell programs, and uh, tox. Re so one of the ways that tox. Uh, locks T cells into a quote unquote exhausted program is by really modifying the epigenetic landscape. And she shows that after a couple of weeks, that tox, uh, uh, tox expression is initiated by NFAT, so TCR stimulation. And, and at, if you give tox enough time, it will remodel the chromatin in a way that the program, the exhausted or the tox dependent program, becomes permanent and self sustaining. And um, it shows that a way of kind of getting in the way of these reprogramming is through and really uh, hitting STAT5, which STAT5 is uh, coincidentally downstream of IL-2 signaling. And 
we know IL-2 has, uh, is the, you know, the original immunotherapy. We know that it can improve T-cell uh, function and tumors. It's hard to use because it can be toxic at the concentration you need to inject for, for tumoral uh, efficacy. efficacy. Uh, so, but he, because he knows the drug in STAT-5 is a good thing, it helps you, and this is in, in also related to Rafi Ahmed's uh, talk from yesterday. He shows some data from this ortholog IL-2, uh, which has uh, both a receptor and a cytokine that are mutated to recognize each other, and then signal the cell through IL-2, uh, through STAT-5, which uh, I will talk about a little bit later, later because Chris Garcia actually uh, presented on this too. And he shows that combination therapy, again, this idea of comb combining anti-PD-1 plus this ortholog IL-2 uh, can result in a unique reprogramming of, of T cells in a context of, of, of the adopt adoptive cell therapy. Um, and that really the synergy, uh, it makes a huge difference. And then I want to give a shout out, closing the session, Daphne Bayik from the University of Miami. And she was talking about glioblastoma and how uh, sex-linked differences in the response to GABA pathway modulators, so uh, from, from, from uh, neurotrans neurotransmitter, actually can affect uh, the immune response to uh, glioblastoma uh, through expression on macrophages. Uh, of NOS2, and this uh, the, this expression impairs tumor clearance, but this is something kind of a female only, uh, female specific response. Uh, so she had also as a rising star, I think it was a rising star talk at the end of the session. So it was a really cool session. And did you also? So I guess we also went looked at the keynote from Christopher Garcia. We did. Uh, that was fun. I I don't remember where I've heard the story before, but he was looking at really cool. Um, basically protein engineering of cytokines to be partial agonists and so that you can alter what effect they're having so that there's, you know, because we, we know like one of these cytokines hits multiple things downstream, it can hit multiple stats or whatever. And so yeah. he's, he's basically using a sh almost a shotgun approach with a little bit of design from structural biology, some yeah. of it, to, to really come up with different ways to make it so that you can have partial agonism mm -hmm. of any any cytokine receptor essentially that yeah. he's going after and so then you could have either lack of trans or last of six activation you can have partial effects what have you yeah so here are the examples with il2 uh through il12 il10 IL in different gamma he the couples, he really, uh, they really uh, did a great job at like keeping some of the effects of the cytokine by, but avoiding others. I think that's cool. But what I also thought was really fun is the uh, the surrogate cytokine agonists that are derived from like uh, uh, the, nanobodies from from antibodies. Yeah, so they're the nanobody linkers that pull two parts together, but they're conformationally they're not designed to maintain standard conformation of the receptors, and so anything goes. Yeah, and so they cool. sent some really cool stuff, including one structure where the uh, the kinase domains on the inside were not close to each other, but it was a super agonist. So that yeah. really challenges some structural biology questions, and that was neat. Yeah, I love it. Just start from scratch. Why are we even keeping, like, why would we use cytokines? Whatever, you know, moves your stats, just just do it. That's all that matters. Whatever. That was that was a joke worthy of me. <laughs> Brenda, oh my. All right, we're get, we are getting tired here. Oh, all well, right. And then we went to the uh, vaccine talk as well. I think it was really talking about how to respond to pandemics in the future. And part of it's having with, reg I think the keynote part of it was, we have to, as societies and governments and scientists, work with regulators mm -hmm. to have pre-existing platforms that are approved and understood that you can hot swap something into and speed up the approval process. Yeah, uh, these still have to do work, obviously, because every antigen is different. But if the approval, the, if the platform is known and trusted, that paves the way for more rapid deployment. And they have a hundred-day challenge, which they agree is audacious and probably not possible, but still worth looking at. Yeah. So I think uh, it's a very, very interesting day as well. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's getting challenging. It is. Well, you know. And now we are going to, we still have one talk today. The late uh, prize uh, from the Minari, Minari prize, is it? Yes, Minarini prize. And Diane yes. Mathis, looking forward. Yep, and then we'll be back one time tomorrow. And yeah. So that brings us to the end of our latest IUIS 2023 episode. Check back here tomorrow for another episode recapping the final day of the meeting. See you then.